Hi there and welcome to Video Trainer. Uh, with me today I have Dieter Deppich. I met Dieter a few years ago. Um, he used to be and to a certain extent still is the numbers and statistics guy behind Knowledge Factory's uh, product uh, SAPTG which is the South African property transfer guy. Dieter, welcome to Video Trainer and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Maybe you know you could tell us properly what it is that, that you do. Um, other than just obviously SAPTG and Knowledge Factory? Well, um, where, I, where I came from, I was born in Bloom to parents that immigrated from Germany right, in the early 50s, uh, raised and educated in Port Elizabeth, then worked in Johannesburg for a short while, then moved to Namibia, worked there for 10 years, then to Germany for uh, a while, and I moved back to South Africa 12 years ago, and I've been commuting out of George to companies in Cape Town and Johannesburg. The last five years have been a particularly interesting one, or the last seven years, mm -hmm. where I've been involved in uh, business analysis with uh, Knowledge Factory, and particularly with the bias on property statistics yeah. and helping people understand the ins and outs of the property industry. Um, obviously, you dealt with statistics quite a lot. Now, I know that you have a, a very famous saying. It's also the first time that I heard this saying. And uh, let, me, let me quote you. You said that uh, statistics are, are like a bikini. What they reveal is seductive, but what they hide is vital. Now, get to explain that, that sweeping statement. Well, I must be honest, it's not, I didn't invent that saying. It was, uh, I think, said by some professor of economics somewhere in the world. But I thought it, it uh, adequately explained the way and the its statistics are used and misused. Mm, mm. Perhaps I can just elaborate. Journalists particularly love statistics and they will quote them to seduce their audience. They'll often use surveys for example. They'll say in a recent survey of men aged between 20 and 40, 76.5% uh, admitted to having beaten their wives or girlfriends in the last 12 months. While we can't necessarily doubt the veracity of the results of the statistics, mm -hmm. but few of the readers of the article will ask, who were those men? In which country? What demographic? What race group? What education group? If, mm -hmm. if I went, for example, and did a survey amongst 20 men at Polsmoor Prison, I'm sure that I'd have the statistic even much higher. Maybe it's 99% who have beaten their yeah, wives or yeah. their girlfriends in the last 12 months. So it's very seductive. It can be twisted to support a particular type of uh, idea, ideology, or the point that you're trying to make. When you peel back the layers, you suddenly realize that hmm, maybe that statistic is not really as mm. truthful as it seems. Let's give another example with it comes to real estate. Uh, a real estate agent may say to a potential client, well, I'm very happy to say that the average price of houses in this suburb have increased since last year by 10% or 15%. Yes. What the client or the potential buyer is not aware of, if he peels back the layers to see what is really vital, is that in the suburb, which may contain 1,200 houses, there were only 10 sales. And of the 1,200 houses, they have three different price categories, mm -hmm. a higher, a middle, and a lower. Mm -hmm. And the 10 houses that sold, eight of them were in the higher price category. So yes, the average price for the suburb compared to last year might be higher, but it's a very small sample, and it's a very small sample in a very specific location within the suburb. Yes. And so it gives a, an incorrect picture to the, the listener. So that's why I encourage everybody, whether you're a reader or watch television, if st some statistic is mentioned, Peel back the layers, find out what is it really trying to say. Somebody once said to me that all, all 90, 93.5% of all statistics are made up on the spot. <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> like this one just now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, you started with a consulting business um, also called Brain Juice. And for all our uh, viewers, you can find Dieter on, on Facebook where he's quite active and I know that all, on all the other social media channels as well. Now, your tagline there is analysis plus actionable results equals a profitability boost. Um, what do you mean by that? 
there are mis- many business analysts, and I'm sure there are many business analysts out there with far better qualifications than I have. But what's been interesting when speaking to business owners who have used analysts in the past is the fact that business analysis itself does not lead to a profitability boost. And ultimately, if you're paying someone to analyze your business, uh, you're hoping that there's going to be a return on investment. Mm-hmm. You're hoping that if you paid him 20, 30, or 50,000 Rand, that ultimately you're going to get much more than that back once you've put into practice what he's suggested. So what many business analysts do is they'll go through the business, they'll look at the various processes, production process, management processes, uh, human resources, human capital, and then identify certain gaps, perhaps it's effic- inefficiency gaps, it may be marketing gaps, and this a long list of gaps, and then present that to management and say, here are all the problems mm-hmm. in your business. Mm-hmm. And we suggest that you work on these. Often, very few of that long list is an actionable result, which will result in profitability boost. Let me give you an example. If, I, if you uh, are the owner of a small car parts uh, you you sell car parts, small business, SME. And so business analyst comes along and he gives you a long list of 17 gaps. And he says, you know, one of the gaps is marketing. You're not marketing correctly. You just have a signboard outside. You should also have flags. And uh, your business cards, they don't look anywhere near professional. And you you don't have a Facebook page. You don't have a Twitter page. You're not, you, I've never heard any of your adverts on television. You don't advertise in the radio, mm. on, on uh, print media. Well, that's true. Those might all be gaps. But which one of those gaps, if they were filled, would result in a profitability boost? Yes. Do the clients who purchase car parts engage on Facebook or Twitter? And even if they do use Facebook and Twitter social or other social medias, would they engage with a car parts dealer on that platform? And so, yes, a gap may be analyzed, but it may not have an actionable result okay. that brings about profitability. So my work, I'm not a, a chartered accountant, um, but I look specifically where those actionable results are. Where can we find them and which one of those actions can as quickly within the next 12 months actually uh, improve mm. the book? There's a saying also that uh, what gets measured gets managed. And, and I think that ties into what you're saying. It's not also just it actually takes it further because it's not just measuring stuff. Um, it, the numbers in itself won't lead you anywhere. It will lead you somewhere, but you still have to then take specific actions. And you may not have the resources. Yeah. You may not have the human resources or the time or the money yes. to implement and fill those gaps. Mm. And so if the business an- analyst is aware of that, then why even identify them? You may say, look, Long term, you may want to look at these things, but right now, there's just two things you have to do. You need another mm. person behind the counter, for example, because I walk in here and I see there's people standing long queues and eventually they just walk out because there's no, not enough people yeah, to help you. Yeah. It may be something as simple as that, mm. that is the most important actionable result, which results in a profitability boost. Now, a lot of our viewers, most of our viewers are entrepreneurs. Um, in various stages of, of their business life. Now, when you're an entrepreneur, um, there's a lot of things that you have to do. And to be clear, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that statistics is one of the more popular disciplines that, <laughs> that entrepreneurs want to, to pay attention to. Why should they? Well, you know, the minute you, you use two words, the two words, statistical analysis in the same sentence, you often find people get sort of a glaze look over their eyes. Yes. They're thinking lots of numbers, lots of spreadsheets, lots of graphs. I'm, they've lost interest straight yeah. away. And they forget that before they start a business, low-level statistical analysis can actually help them make success with their business. Yes. Let me give you an example. Often what happens is that the reality is clouded by emotion. Many people have a dream. They say, you know what, I've always dreamed of having a coffee shop, or I've always wanted a pizza joint, or I've always wanted to do IT training, Mm. or sell car parts, Mm. or run a golf shop, or whatever the case may be. And yet they do very little competitor analysis. Mm. 
even if they see the reality, if they drive around on a Sunday afternoon, they say, yes, well, there are another 17 coffee shops in the suburb or in the area that I'm hoping to, to work in. Emotion clouds that statistic. They'll say, but my coffee shop will have the freshest cakes because I'll get my mother-in-law to bake them. Yeah. And yeah. my waiters will speak four <clears throat> languages, so we'll cater for the tourist market. And we will have only bone china uh, teacups to serve our, our product in. And that will, that will make, give us a USP, a unique selling proposition. The other thing that they never do is they don't really look at their trade area analysis. So how many people are likely to come to the store or the venue that you've chosen for your yes, shop? Yes. Um, it may be at a busy intersection, but there may be no pedestrian traffic. There may be lots of vehicles. But nobody actually walks there because there may not be sufficient parking mm, mm. or the parking may be too expensive or it may be not near to another shop which will help you get foot traffic. So those, that statistical analysis, without any graphs, without a spreadsheet, that statistical analysis because doing that will help you to realize, should I even start this business? Yeah, yeah. And that ultimately brings you to, you know, the next point which is sustainability yeah yeah i think you you encapsulated it perfectly uh, a lot of people are um you know they, they don't want to get as you say they get the glazed expression for lack of a better word um but it's true and and it, it's just the name the point is we all do statistical analysis almost on a daily basis and definitely in a day on a daily basis in business yeah so for for our new entrepreneurs starting up what do you think, I know this is a difficult question to answer, but what do you think are the most important numbers that they really need to start thinking about as they get into business or, you know, those who have just started? Two numbers. Six and zero. <laughs> what is that? Can you operate, can you start up a business and operate for six months with zero income? <laughs> and, and many... Business plans fall flat right there. Yeah. And the truth of the, the reality of the matter is that is why we see so many shops and businesses, whether it's a product or a service that they offer, open up with big fanfare and 12 months, 18 months down the line, there's a too late sign yeah. and they've disappeared with squandered a lot of money mm. uh, in a dream that they were hoping to realize. So one of the things is, just ask yourself that, can I operate this business for six months with zero income to me? And the reason for that is, is that many businesses forget what it actually costs to get a business off the ground. Many think, well, I can afford the rent. So the rent is 5,000 Rand a month. Wonderful. So then the first month you have to put down a deposit. And many commercial entities want even perhaps two months deposit. So there's 15 thousand rand you have to lay down that's fine you may have already have that as a capital expenditure then you have shop fitting it of course mm. as well you have to buy stock so that's your upfront costs and you say right now we're ready to start making some money and then that's where the cookie starts crumbling because yeah. what they often forget is that have I budgeted for marketing costs yeah because nobody knows about me Yes, I may sell the freshest cakes and my waiters may speak four languages, but who knows that? Yeah. Do I have enough money to market today, tomorrow, next week, the next month? Because one of the costs, and it's a quantifiable cost that many small entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs of small businesses forget, is competitor response. Mm. You've no sooner launched your business and you see a spike in your income, and you think that because you've got this brilliant business idea mm. and your cakes are the freshest that all your competitors will just throw their hands up in the air and say, you know what, there's no ways we can compete with this new kid on the block, we're all just going to close our doors and go home. They like, don't. Yeah. They immediately launch a counterattack and they will put adverts in the paper offering coffee at even cheaper prices, fresher cakes. Their, their waiters will speak five languages and they will have even more expensive china and, and, and all the bells and whistles to get those people back. Mm. So that's another number is competitor response. And then the third number to remember, so it's six zero and competitor response. The, the, the fourth item 
is to remember is the fact that when you stand back and you look at that business, think of your human capital and its costs. It costs money to acquire staff, but it costs even more money to train, train them, and then you have to retain them. Because no sooner have you trained them than someone else, a competitor responding, may approach them and take them off your hands, and you start from scratch. Yeah. And that often happens in the first six months. And then sadly, many entrepreneurs, because they get into a financial bind, uh, misinterpret revenue as salary. Uh, of course. So 20 or 30 or 50,000 rand comes through the till, and they put it in their pocket, and then next month, when they have to deal with all these other costs, they start using their personal credit card, then it's their home loan, and that's the start of the end. And 18 months later, is a too late sign up in the door. Mm -hmm. Very, very sad that we see so many businesses not doing the basic homework before they start. I agree. I agree. I like the fact that you touched on, or that you touched on, on, on businesses that that just don't make it. I often deal with uh, entrepreneurs who tell me that you know they're still feeling the pinch of of the global sluggish economy. Uh, definitely, South Africans are, are, are saying that. Are they still right? You know, um, and and I know that you're also uh, well known for for your economical analyses and things that you've done, you know, around that. So I think you're a perfect guy to ask these questions. Well, you know, the when you talk about economics and it's particularly South African, the South African economy, there's one of two classes you end up being in: either the the uh, eternal optimist, and you just want people to feel warm and fuzzy inside. Or you're the doomsday prophet. Yes. I really try to be a lot more neutral and uh, a little bit more realistic about the picture. There are certain positives in South Africa's economy that one can be proud of. Number one, there's a very tight fiscal regime. Uh, monetary policy has been outlined very clearly. We have a reserve bank which is admired by many other countries. That's right. We have a reserve bank governor who really knows her stuff and has a tight grip and a tight monitoring of how the economy is, 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 is working. And uh, the way in which they, the various factors that they look at, for example, every uh, few weeks when they sit to discuss whether the interest rate will be uh, shifted up or down, are, are highly technical and highly complicated and very sophisticated. So, those are, so we have a relatively financial, stable financial systems in place. Our banking system is relatively risk-free. Those are the pluses. There, there are a number of minuses, and, and this is where it comes down to the core and speaks to ultimate long-term or, or short-term growth prospects. Let me just focus on the short-term growth prospects. First of all, we have a fragile RAND, which is fluctuating up and down, which affects exports. And exports is how a country makes money. Yeah. It's all fine and well importing. But you want exports. And the mines are under great pressure, not just with a rand weakness, but there are two other factors. Low productivity. South Africa has, has very low productivity as far as workers or working ethos is concerned. And number two, the wage demands are well in excess of inflation. Unfortunately, a culture has now developed, especially in the sort of the last 24 months, where workers believe that if the if we don't get our demands and we just up the violence yeah. a notch or two, then the demands will be met, and it has been met, and that sets a precedent for the next violent protest. Mm -hmm. And and so and so employers are held to ransom. Many of those increases are not sustainable. So ultimately, when there's five or six thousand workers have now received a twelve percent wage increase, which is twice inflation. Down the line, maybe 2,000 of those workers will lose their work because the company can't remain yeah. sustained. And the company's directors, the company's board has a duty to its shareholders. Of course. So there's a much bigger picture than just the miner trying to get an increased wage. Mm. Yes, a living wage, that's what we all want. There's a few other things, and that is that when we look at the South Africa's human capital, we're quite low on the uh, totem pole. In When I speak about human capital, I'm talking about the intelligence, business intelligence available 
for a burgeoning economy and a, gr and a growth economy. Two years ago, in 2011, the World Economic Forum made a list of 144 countries and rated them as far as their education systems are concerned. South Africa was rated 140 out of 144 countries. Right at the bottom. Right at the bottom. In fact, <clears throat> lower than countries such as Lesotho and Swaziland. In last year's World Economic Forum, they looked at specifically the financial development. So this is business development of countries. It was a much shorter list with 62 countries. South Africa was also in that list. And that financial development and growth looked at seven pillars, financial pillars. And included in that, of course, is things such as financial stability, the cost of doing business, education, because it, that fits in very much so. And it was interesting how South Africa performed on that level. Mm. We ult our ultimate, uh, I have the stats here now, this is now last year's economic forum, <coughs> excuse me, ultimately we were ranked 17th out of 62 countries on financial stability, which is excellent. That's so we're doing best, well yeah. as far as that's concerned. When it came to tertiary education and the quality of our maths and science, we were ranked 62 out of 62 dead countries. Lost. Absolutely dead loss. Uh, there's also concern about the lack of high quality specialized training services. We were ranked very low as far as that's concerned. Also, there was some contradictions. South Africa, for example, is one of the cheapest countries in the world to register business. If you want to register business through CPIC, it's a closed corporation or a PDY limited. It's one of the cheapest mm -hmm. countries in the world to That's do right. that. The other end of the spectrum when it comes to the real estate market, it's one of the most expensive to register property in your name. Yeah. So the ultimate cost to do business in South Africa is often nowhere near as inviting as it should be to potential investors. And so they'll shy away and rather go to markets where their return on investment will be much faster or possibly higher. Mm, mm. And so ultimately, you know, short answer to what do I think of the South African economy, it's fragile and it has a long way to go before we will see the growth that we had uh, a few years back. I think most entrepreneurs will, will agree with you there. Most entrepreneurs feel it day, day to day, you know, they feel the pinch, they feel all these things. Um, there are good signs, luckily, such as, um, now, I might have the exact, the, the exact development wrong now, but what I, what I heard is that uh, apparently uh, First National Bank and um, CIPC, in some sort of partnership, um, decided now to come up with a very fast-tracked way. Also, it, it sounds like it's going to be all online or you know internet-based. Um, and essentially, what it means is that if you get your business account from Standard Bank, uh, not Standard Bank, First National Bank. If you get your business account from First National Bank, that very same day or no more than 48 hours later, your business company CC. Okay, it's not CC now will be registered, brand new, from scratch, which is, it's a world first, you know, so they, there are good things happening, but it's I a very agree. innovative bank. Yeah, it's a very innovative bank. Talking about that, you've, you've written in the past about, about, you know, the way that the economy is changing. Um, one of the things that I read that you wrote about was about the connection economy. And I, I found that quite interesting. Do you, would you like to share that with, with our viewers? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting term. And one must understand that the way in which we do business today, um, the growth, economic growth model that is being used in business in the Western world particularly, only really developed in sort of the late 19th and early 20th century. Right. And it has morphed into a completely different animal even since then. You know, when our grandparents or our great-grandparents went to a corner store to buy their local groceries, uh, the store owner might have been in a good mood or a bad mood. He didn't care. You know, he said, if you walked in there cheerfully and greeted him and he just grumbled at you, you asked him for a pound of sugar and he gave you a pound of sugar and you bought it. Where else would you go in any case? There was no really reason for him to connect with you. Today, however, we live in a connection economy. That's right. 
And uh, there's a marketing guru by the name of Seth Godin in the United States who made a brilliant illustration. He says it's like playing ping pong, you know, table tennis. He says if, if you've got someone at the other end of the table who isn't enthusiastic about playing ping pong, how much are you going to enjoy it? You're not. Yeah. You know, if you're enthusiastic, you want to play, and he's just like slap dash, couldn't be bothered. So we need to be able to connect with our clients, if I'm a doctor, with my patients, if I'm a service provider with the people that I'm, or a training provider with the people that I'm teaching, if I'm a, a real estate agent with my potential homeowners, right. I need to be able to connect mm. with them. And how do I connect? Well, there has to be mutual enthusiasm. That person has to engage with me more than just, well, you know, you've got the cheapest widget and I will buy it from you. And I, my attitude must not be, well, I'm just going to sell you this widget because I need to put food on the table. That type of connection is going to crumble very fast mm. because people want to engage with you as a business because in most cases there are 17 other businesses like you selling the same product at a, That's true. possibly even a cheaper price. That's true. So why should they continue buying from you? You need to be able to connect with people. Um, it really comes down to that beautiful expression we have here in Africa, Ubuntu. Yeah. The, the, the literal meaning of the word Ubuntu means I am what I am because of who we all are. I am what I am because of who we all are. We're connected. There's no way that I can say, well, I, I'm an, I'm, you know, no man is an island. I, I can just live without any other people. Mm. No, especially in business, you need to be able to connect at a, at a deeper level than just, well, this is my product and it costs X amount of money. That's right. Ita, that's, that's, that's great. Um, you know, I, while I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, if, if I was a... If I was a complete newbie to, to business now, or you know, I had stars in my eyes, I wanted to start with something. Where would you say, where would you say are the uh, the, the opportunities now? Even if, if they're not that obvious, but where where would you say the the unseen opportunities are for new people to business? You know, people thinking to start out with something on their own. Sharing expertise, training. You know, we have this wonderful thing instituted a few years ago, the CETAs in South Africa, sector education uh, training. Uh, and then you have all the various CETAs uh, for the medical industry, for the real estate industry, uh, for local government, and so on. The CETAs receive a, a levy, a skills development right. levy from all the businesses. Mm -hmm. The CETAs are very wealthy. They have a lot of money. But they seldom can pay out money for training courses that are ultimately beneficial to help people in their work. Also, you have so many people out there who have incredible skills, whether it be in IT, in medicine, in teaching, teaching teachers, in social skills. Um, you know, people these days lack social skills because of almost a 24-hour, 24 hours a day on-screen engagement with their clients via email or Twitter or Facebook mm -hmm. or via telephone, but there's no face-to-face -face engagement. And so what happens is their social skills crumble, that affects their work relationship and certainly affects their personal relationships at home as well. Uh, we have experts in engineering, in maths, in science, uh, we have experts in writing skills, in arts, in culture, we have people out there with PhDs who are now possibly semi-retired, and if they could only just share their expertise. Of course, yeah. One, as I've just mentioned, the World Economic Forum found that South Africa has such a poor education system. Well, there's something we can do about it, because we do have a talented pool of people out there Definitely. with skills. Yeah. So to start a business that can help people develop a skill that is a productivity boost and also a profitability boost, mm. There is such a big gap in that market and very few people and very few businesses do it effectively and I truly believe that that's one sector where any entrepreneur with the necessary skills and expertise registered with the necessary authorities or credit with the necessary authorities will be able to uh, make us have a sustainable business. Yes, it, it, it has become so easy almost to share your knowledge with 
people who might be interested in, in hearing about that. We're doing it right now. We're we? doing it right now. Shameless plug for video training. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, look, I, I met you as, as the numbers and statistics guy at, at SAPTG. And you used to come out with this property clock, I remember, on, your, on the website, on the SAPTG website, where maybe you should explain it to our viewers, but my actual question is, where are we? On the property clock, where, where are the hands right now with South African property as it stands? Well, the property clock just measured it, it was an overall view of the residential property market as far as where we are with a buyer's or a seller's market. Uh, it certainly still is a buyer's market, it's very much biased that way. There has been some positive movement uh, in the last uh, two months, particularly as far as average house price is concerned, even median house prices have improved in some areas and the overall picture looks a little bit more positive than it did, say, six months ago. That's right, yeah. But for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, the core fragility within the economy um, is now also being felt at retail level. For example, we've seen uh, vehicle sales, which were booming in a lot, most of last year, have suddenly fallen off the charts. It just one dealer, or two dealers uh, I spoke to, just happened to speak to this week, said where they, on average, would sell 15 to 20 vehicles a month. Uh, this month, so far, and we are the 26th of April, they've sold one. Goodness. One has sold one, the other, other one has sold two. He says it doesn't matter. People just are not buying. And the interest rate hasn't increased. Mm. So there, there's clearly pressure still on the consumer out there. The need of consumers to, to consolidate their debt, I think that has really come very, been very forceful in the media and people are then realizing, mm, perhaps I should hold back. And ultimately, as far as the uh, real estate market is concerned, that's going to hold the real estate market back. Because people are not moving, changing jobs as often, which often is a driver as far as real yeah. estate sales yeah. are concerned, yeah. that also has impacted. So I think that we've still got a long, long way to go to experience the boom that we had in the 2005-2006 period. That's right. Long way to go. I've heard of, uh, about that boom, and uh, that, that seems like a distant memory now. <laughs> Indeed. You are quite active on the social media channels, as I said, and, and everywhere else. Obviously, that's, that's not, it's not limited to that. But, um, you and I have spoken about this once before, and I know that you've lectured about this before. How do you think property marketing has changed? Obviously, a lot of our viewers are estate agents in South Africa working here right now. How has the landscape changed? You know, how has property marketing changed from, from before? Primarily, it's need-driven. Now, you know, the days of where people would upscale for the sake of upscaling, they will think twice. And even if they don't think twice, the bank will help them think twice. That's right. And they won't get the funding. Yeah. Um, moving simply to a nicer neighborhood is all set aside in, in, for, in terms of economics. Can we afford to live there? And not only can we afford to move, can, can we afford to live there, but can we afford to actually move? So that's one of the big things. Um, key words that potential customers want to hear now are things like value for money bargain. Mm -hmm. they, they're reacting emotively to words like that. Uh, two bedroom granny flat for extra income. Very important tagline right. if, it's, if it's applicable. Close to schools and to business. Um, finance arranged in the case of a developer or even better no transfer costs. Ah, yeah. So it's all need driven. People yes they feel well, we're in a two-bedroomed house, we've got two kids already, we have to move. So it's need-driven. But even then, they really think carefully because how sure am I that I'm still going to have my job next year so that I can afford the bond? Mm. And so I think that also when it comes to the way in which property is marketed, professionals need to think to respond to the current needs of the market, and that is very price conscious, they, buyers particularly, are in the belief that most sellers have got cuckoo land prices 
and that prices can drop by 25% or more. Mm. And so sometimes the offers that they will make are what the real estate agent might believe ridiculous. But they don't think so. Mm. And uh, to some real estate agent's amazement, some of those offers have been accepted. Have been accepted, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it, it, you're quite right. Eh? If we get somebody in through the doors uh, eight times out of ten, it's, it's somebody looking for a bargain. And the fact of the matter is there, there are a lot of bargains now. You know, a lot of people selling are in trouble and they, you know, they will sell for, for very low prices just to offload those properties. Okay, I think we've covered a lot of material. I, I just want to ask you one more thing about property specifically. Having been in this industry for quite a while now and, and having dealt with, with property professionals for so long, if you had to give one piece of advice, the best piece of advice that you can give to, to a real estate uh, professional, what would that be? Be a subject matter expert. <laughs> Same man. And, and, and I, what I mean by that is not to just know how many houses you have mm. on, uh, in your portfolio or what their prices are or what amenities those properties have. But be a subject matter expert means knowing your market, your target market. Most estate agents do not deal throughout the entire spectrum of the property market. There's, I've never yet met an estate agent that sells houses for 400,000 and for 40 million. I haven't met them. Maybe they are there, but I haven't met them. Most of them are very specific and they deal in a relatively narrow price band. So do you know the people in that price band? Do you really know what their needs are? Uh, many times, estate agents believe that simply just knowing the area, or I have lived in this suburb for 20 years, I know this area like the back of my hand. That's fine, but do you know real estate as a subject matter expert? Mm -hmm. Because the client these days is so attuned with the amount of information that he can derive from the internet, sometimes he knows more about that house or that property, or its value, mm. and he comes armed with that information to the real estate agent. And true, the real estate true. agent is not aware uh, of uh, just how knowledgeable the potential client may be. Mm. So be a subject matter expert or you will lose clients. That's a, that's a fact. Fantastic. I, I agree with you fully, Dave. Um, what you said about clients, buyers coming to you absolutely forearmed with, with proper, real uh, knowledge about you know the properties that they are looking at, the market that they are looking at, the specific area, whatever they know, and um, we have They've to done a lot of comparisons as well. Exactly, we have to start respecting our clients. I think you know also with their knowledge and all that. Peter, I wanted to cover more material with you, but you know what? This this interview is, is going to go on for for much longer. We might have to schedule another one at, at some stage. Where can our viewers reach you and and I think what I'm asking is not only where can they reach you, but what are you busy with right now? I know that you've moved on recently to other you know, bigger and better things than most. At the moment, I'm consulting for a company um, and actually being contracted as the CEO of a, a newly established language academy. The name is Eden Language Academy, so they can reach me at uh, uh, that email address, Dita at EdenLA, languageacademy.com. Or my email address is uh, for my, my consulting business is Dita at brainjuice.com. But what Eden Language Academy does, and it's a very exciting project, and I'm really excited to be part of it, is industry specific language courses um, in 12 different languages mm. in South Africa. And what it does is it speaks to actionable results and profitability boosts and product productivity boosts. Mm. Because when you get people connected, you spoke about a connection economy, and especially as far as language is a barrier to connection, when that barrier is lifted, and even if I can just speak a few words of my client or my patient's uh, language, there's a connectedness. And once that connectedness is made, there's a loyalty that starts developing, a relationship that starts developing, mm. a trust and confidence in me as the seller of product or services and that will have that client coming back for more. And so we're offering that both to the private sector and to um, government, local government, to national government, 
It's a very exciting project and uh, by all means visit our Facebook page at Eden Language Academy to learn more about uh, what it's doing. And it's a local business based here in the Garden Route but expanding throughout the country. We will put the links up to, to Dita's various businesses or this business, but the various places where you can reach on Facebook and, and on the internet. We will put it up uh, down below this video. This is normally the time when I say um, please join Video Tracker if you haven't. Uh, subscribe. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on the internet, on our website, and also on Facebook and all the other social media channels. But we get guys like Dita in here to, to talk to us on a regular basis. And uh, you can only improve your knowledge with that. Dieter, it's been fantastic. Thank you very much, and I really do appreciate the, the time you spent with us. Great, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks.